So welcome everyone to the Hypnosis for Permanent Weight Loss podcast. I'm your host, Leslie M. Thornton. And today we are here with Carol. Carol, tell me your last name. I don't even know at this point. May, as in the month. Wow, Carol May. So happy to have her here. And as you can tell, she's got her amazing accent from the UK. Happy to have her. So Carol is a disruptive health coach, which I absolutely love. Can't wait to get into that a little bit more. And uh, she is an eating disorders. She has a master's practitioner Mm -hmm. and a weight loss counselor. And uh, Carol actually was speaking with my assistant and I got little glimpses of what their conversation entailed. And, you know, what I really am committed to for, you know, my listeners of my podcast is uh, that they really get other people's perspectives and other people's stories that really helps them uh, feel like they're not alone because I'm Mm -hmm. sure you've seen it in your work, Carol, that a lot of this is the people that I'm speaking with. They think that nobody else understands what it's like to constantly be thinking about food and obsessed with all this kind of stuff all the time. And I know for myself, that was the case as well. I just kind of learned to close my mouth and not say anything about it, which made matters way, way worse. So I'm just so glad Mm -hmm. that there's platforms like this out there today that are allowing people to actually realize that it's an actual thing and there is a way out of that place and life can become so much more expansive and happy and joyful um, when you're willing to do the work and kind of look at, like we were just saying prior to, you know, pushing record on this interview, <laughs> that there, it's always what's behind, you know, what food and all that kind of stuff. And that's what we're all about here at Hypnosis for Permanent Weight Loss. So Carol, thanks so much for being here. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. So I think what I'd like to ask you first is about your story of how this whole thing came about for you. You know, maybe your challenge Mm -hmm. prior to discovering this work in whatever capacity you did and yeah, your catalyst. I know you mentioned your divorce and all those kinds of things. So if you wouldn't mind sharing that, we'd love to hear. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was put on the diet when I was 12. That was my first diet with um appetite suppressant tablets as well which of course are now certainly here in the uk they're illegal um <clears throat> because actually they can kill you so it's you know, when i think about it now it's it's really horrendous and also i wasn't overweight i was i felt big because i was very tall and um and interestingly you know, about 30 years later, I had the same experience with my own daughter, who as a teenager felt big because she was very tall. She's over six foot. Um, and, <clears throat> and that kind of started the process, the yo-yo darting process, um, mixed in with very poor body image. Um, I had a mother who had very poor body image, so I, I guess I kind of learned it from her. And <clears throat> I'm a child of the 1950s, so I was born at a time when processed foods began to come onto the market. So you know, by the time I was a student, then it was, it was yogurt and stuff. And then, of course, we had the low-fat revolution over here. I don't know about there in the States. So everything was low-fat, so it was higher carb, which actually for my body wasn't right and so I followed every single diet around and when I look back at the photographs I wasn't overweight you know it was just this total obsession with my body and that it wasn't I didn't look like the model Elle McPherson I wanted her legs and I didn't have them and I just thought that by dieting I could do that well actually no that wasn't going to happen and because then I had my children, I developed postnatal depression. Um, I'd always had a touch of um, social anxiety as well, in addition to that. And the depression was really, really bad. And I was just, I kind of grew into this very shouty mummy person. Um, then the menopause hit. And of course, my body changed shape all on its own. And I thought, okay, this isn't any good. I have to go on another diet. And um, I found very low calorie diets, you know, the soups and shakes and bars and stuff. And I thought it was my golden um, ticket, if you like, 
to the body that I'd always wanted. And yeah, you know, initially I lost weight. Absolutely, I did. But um, I'm, a, I'm a real rebel at heart. And so, you know, actually sticking to the plan wasn't really what I wanted to do. And but having found it, I thought, oh, do you know what? I think I, I could um, I could help other other women do this. So I trained <clears throat> and I trained. I was already trained as a counsellor, but I trained with one of the companies over here. And I thought, that's it. I found it. You know, this is the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but of course, in my private life, stuff had got a bit out of hand. Um, my ex-husband is a, is a tenant, was a tenant farmer. And when his mum died, he developed a problem with alcohol. Um, so actually our relationship was completely disintegrating alongside of this. <clears throat> and whilst I knew that the counselling part of this was working for people, somehow there was something about this kind of soups and shakes thing that didn't quite fit with me. So my counselling supervisor said, go and train in eating disorders. And then my eyes were opened mm -hmm. to all of the research that is out there about very low calorie diets. Um, we had lots of trainers come in. Um, I upgraded my nutrition training. Um, and everybody in the room, although we were all professionals, everybody else in the room, apart from one person, had an eating disorder of some sort. So they were either recovering from anorexia, bulimia, obesity, you know, you name it, we all had it. And it, that opened my eyes to just what a real problem this was. Um, and then my marriage fell apart completely and I had a breakdown and my body went, oh, okay, then, right. Um, you're not eating properly. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna make you fat again. So two stone went on just like that. And, and that just added to my depression. And as a result of my divorce, I was actually homeless and bankrupt. So I was homeless for 18 months and living with people where I didn't have control over what I was eating, which helped a great deal. <clears throat> and I'd also reached a stage of, of the menopause where I couldn't, everything hurt, my joints ached, I couldn't exercise anymore. Um, I could walk, I walked to work, but it was just, you know, and I wasn't safe to work with clients at that point in time. So I stopped doing that. And then <clears throat> I started working with, with a business coach. Well, she'd been a business mentor for me. And she said to me, she contacted me. She'd been quiet for a few years and she contacted me and she said, I want to develop this new program. Would you help me be a guinea pig? <clears throat> so I said, yeah, absolutely I will. And what, looking back, I now realize what she was using but at the time it was just you know she said well we're going to work on some emotional stuff because the resistance comes up yes. and <clears throat> she said you know we're going to look at your anger your vi your victim place that you, you your stance that you've taken on various other things and I'm going hmm I feel really entitled to these emotions <laughs> things and these thoughts because <clears throat> I've been very hard done by thank you very much and she went yeah but <clears throat> how is that helping you hmm okay yeah but I'm still really entitled to these things mm -hmm. all these bad things have happened to me and let me list off all the bad things of course yeah I've wouldn't you be angry uh-huh yeah right exactly that so anyway eventually I don't know I, I can't I can remember the day that it happened and we, she and I were, were talking over the phone because she, you know, she, we didn't have Zoom back then. And, um, <clears throat> and I could feel the physical weight of these emotions lift as I decided clearly to let go of them, that they didn't serve me anymore. It was only hurting me. It wasn't hurting him and his girlfriend, who actually had been a client of mine. Oh, 
So, you know, it was kind of a slightly complicated situation. <clears throat> As I felt that weight lift off me, the only way I described it was like taking this enormous rucksack off my back that went from my shoulders right down to the floor. Mm. And subsequently to that, <clears throat> firstly, my daughter said to me, you've changed mum. And I went, yeah. And she said, you must be ill. No, I'm not ill. <laughs> you changed, yeah. So you're not ill? No. Okay, you're just weird then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you know what weird I'll take? Uh -huh, yeah. Because I, was, I wasn't the person that they recognised. Mm. I wasn't shouting all the time. I wasn't all this stuff. I'm like kind of, oh yeah, okay, what the hell. Mm. Very much living in the moment. And secondly, my body released <clears throat> what I call its pounds of pain. And in the first month, 21 pounds disappeared. And I only realized they'd gone because my trousers fell down at work. <laughs> <laughs> wow, at work. Oh. Yeah. And then, because we had to go up downstairs a lot. Yeah. And, then, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. I think I might weigh myself because I'd stopped weighing myself. Hmm, that's interesting. 21 pounds have gone. I wonder how that happened. Anyway, in a total, I lost, my body released 44 pounds of weight. And my weight has been stable now for the first time in my life. Mm. Six years. Wow. Yeah. That's absolutely incredible. There's so much gold in everything that you shared there. Yeah. So yeah. what was that experience like when you were, I mean, do you remember that moment when you made the decision to let all of that stuff go? Was there something that happened that catalyzed that? I think, I mean, every session we had included meditation mm -hmm. and they were her meditations. They were, it was her stuff. Mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> we'd been working together for three months and I trusted her. And I trusted And... and I think that um, it was very much, I guess I just thought, do you know what? I, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Can just let it go. And now that I've learned all about the three principles, which is actually what she was talking, what she was using, if you like, <clears throat> I now realize, I've realized that I have the power within me to let go. My thoughts, actually, they are part of me and I have the power not to think those things anymore. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. There's so much. Yes, absolutely. So meditation you trusted her and then it sounds like you took responsibility through your awareness of these yeah. thoughts are not who i am and i can think different thoughts yeah. oh my god i can't agree with yeah. anything anymore so when people so obviously hypnosis is you know the main tool that i use which mm -hmm. there's similarities with the meditation right and yeah. um, the only thing people ask me all the time the difference between meditation and hypnosis so meditation is more to train the mind to stay in the present moment and relax and kind of in a general way hypnosis is more targeted towards exactly what it is that you're wanting to accomplish you know freedom from food and being lean strong and healthy and all those kinds of things so mm -hmm. and the power of retraining your brain to slow down enough and you can let me know if this was your experience of just like over and over again the practice of it to slow down enough to be able to have awareness and feel into your body and, you know, think about thoughts in a different way versus just the reactive mode of, but look at what horrible things happened to me and, you know, all of these kinds of things. And you just don't even know that it's happening before your mind is in that place. And then I yeah. also say to people, because I get the question of, does it ever not work for people? Right. So it's like, how does hypnosis? And I get people all the time who've done hypnosis in the past and we have a quick conversation about it and it's clearly understood as to why it didn't work in the past for them. Um, and so the, uh, something I say all the time is the trust in the person that you're working with, that it really makes a difference in order for you to be able to relax enough 
to be able to, you know, feel safe enough to have someone else hold space for you. And then again, and, and then I love that third part that you mentioned about the awareness that you had. And I took it as taking full responsibility. I remember I had an uncle who was a social worker. I still have an uncle who's a social worker. He's retired now. And I was depressed as like a 13 year old, I believe. And it was because I gained a bunch of weight. I didn't play basketball that year. And so body image, and I was just feeling bad about myself, not exercising as much. And he, I think he heard a little bit that I was down in the dumps or whatever as a kid. And he asked to talk to me on the phone and, you know, he was out in Wisconsin and I pick up the phone and he said, you know, something that a lot of people don't realize is that happiness is a choice. Mm. And just, you can choose to be happy at any time. So as you were sharing that story of that whole thing, you know, the rack being lifted from your shoulders all the way down to the floor, you know, just all of those pieces combined and, and realizing that, yeah, those thoughts are what's causing you to feel whatever you're feeling. And if we're able to slow our mind down enough and know how to reprogram those thoughts through many different modalities, Mm -hmm. then you get to have exactly what you had, which is incredible. I mean, yeah. I would never promise that that's, you know, 44 pounds and <laughs> I can't promise those results everywhere for everybody. But I absolutely understand that when you lift that weight off, they've been carrying around your whole life and stop being the victim, taking yep. responsibility, then you get totally freed up. That's amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. And then, yeah, what happened from there? Uh, from there, <clears throat> I just... I just realized that, I mean, I continued working with her and actually she lives at the other end of the country from me, which I know is not a big distance in American terms, but um, it's four hours, four hours driving for me. Um, and she actually operates, she ran a, um, a monthly group. So I would go down for this group uh, once a month, which was an all day experience for about five of us in each of the groups and <clears throat> to reinforce some of this um, I think there's a temptation I've said it myself some of my clients do and they go oh that's it I'm done now I'm fixed mm -hmm. right but mm -hmm. firstly we're not broken Yay. so nothing to fix mm -hmm. and secondly this is just the beginning it's the beginning of um, the the rest of your life mm -hmm. and nothing is ever set in stone so it's you know we, we feel that oh I'm never going back to that place but when it comes to our thoughts they keep bubbling up again mm -hmm. so you know we can find ourselves in that same cycle if we're not careful and so it, it kind of needs reinforcing. So this isn't kind of a, oh, there's a magic wand and oh, you're fixed and you're done because it doesn't work like that. And <clears throat> so I think that you know, part of our job with, with clients is um, showing them that they need ongoing support, you know, and to, to reinforce this learning um and to practice it is that the other thing it's practice isn't it and i think it's very important um that that we also you know, that they have the support from us but also so just to it's almost like we kind of we don't slip back but we can do and it's at those points when if we're not careful that old um, thinking that old diet thinking that old oh you're rubbish thinking all of that negativity stuff can pop up again if we're not careful mm -hmm. um, and or somebody says something to us mm -hmm. along those lines and it can be mm -hmm. that and I think also the other the other problem is that we can look at our weight and our body in isolation but actually, it's just a part of the whole. Mm. So, you know, the work I continued to do with Wendy was we used to do a lot of constellation work. 
um, all sorts of stuff around money um, and relationships. You know, I, ha I had um, at the time, well, for most of my life, really, I had a um, challenging relationship with my sister. So that's all kind of, that's all part of me. So it's, <clears throat> you know, it's looking at the whole thing. So I spent another 18 months really working with her and then um, I threw the towel in at my day job. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I set up um, All Shapes and Sizes Solutions, which was you know, trying to, I mean, the branding was great for that. Um, but just saying to people, you know, we're not all meant to look the same. We are all born as individuals. Mm -hmm. And you know, I used to say, I'm all right between here, <laughs> you know, between my chin and my top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, don't look at the rest of me and I'm thinking oh my goodness you know all those years I used to say that and then when I had my own daughter <laughs> and she goes mom my thighs and da 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 and everything else I think, oh here we go again mm -hmm. and then when my granddaughter was born she was only six months old and the health visitor goes to my daughter-in-law oh um, you should cut back on the milk you're giving her, otherwise she'll get fat. Excuse me, she's only six months old, she's a baby. <laughs> and I'm thinking, it's all, it's all of this negative language mm -hmm. around how we look and that equates our weight with health when that's not so. Not so at all, absolutely not. And I love how realistic you were and really explaining you know what this work actually is and it kind of goes back to what i'm saying about i was speaking to this one woman and she uh said you know i'm actually not going to do your program i've decided i'm actually just going to research a hypnotherapist around and see if you know i can have a little short package with them or something like that and i i straight up said to her i was like i actually don't want you to do that at all and i'm going to tell you why and i was like you're going to go there you're going to you're going to feel peaceful you might even see a little bit of results with the hypnosis i said and right after you're done with that stuff you're going to go right back to the way that it was because of exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. of how you can't take life out of your life you know and if your go-to automatic pattern in your brain is whenever I'm stressed out or angry or sad or whatever it is, food is the numbing agent, you will go back to that, yep. right? So I love that, yeah, you're painting that realistic picture for everybody because there is absolutely science behind, right? The carving out the new neural patterns in the brain and yep. creating new habits and, uh, you know, life tools for yes. how to deal with challenging situations in a more powerful way and there's yeah. always more that you can learn and there's always more mastery you can learn right so when that person or your challenging sister right or or family member or parents or significant other says that thing to you right it's like it would be great like if we could all live in a completely isolated box and we didn't have to deal with somebody said to me in my coaching program the other day how do we prevent ourselves from being triggered in the first place altogether <laughs> and I, I was like that is never gonna happen i'm Ooh. sorry to break you unless you completely isolate yourself in a box you will never have that happen right mm -hmm. and so our goal is to have everybody be fully functioning out there right and i love the fact that you threw the talent on your job that is not um, an uncommon thing that I see, right, with clients, because as you start getting present to what's possible, you get past all these fears, you get past the blocks, you know, that are preventing you, you, you get rid of the relationships that aren't working, you start, you know, having more confidence in yourself, you start taking care of yourself, it becomes less, you know, terrifying yep. to say no to everything, and it feels it, not even less terrifying, it becomes intolerable, in my experience, to yeah. deal with anything that is out of alignment with anything that is me and what Absolutely. makes me. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, you know, what, when I'd done that first three months with Wendy, I described it as being reborn. Mm. Uh, the point of view of, I found myself. Yes. You know, the, the person that I'd left behind when I was very little because I became a people pleaser. 
my sister's only a year younger than me and my mother didn't want another baby so quickly so I, I kind of you know because I'm an intuitive sensitive kind of person I picked up on that that my mother was upset and it was like how am I going to help her and you know <clears throat> she found me crawling around the kitchen floor with a cloth trying to wash it for her because I couldn't walk at that point so I'm crawling and washing with with the dishcloth and and you think oh my goodness I it, it it's kind of um yeah and, and that's when I kind of sort of started leaving that child behind and then I found her again and for the first time in my life that I could remember I could feel emotions because I mothered them with food all that time and my go-to food was always butter because that was available to me as a child so I would slather bread and toast and stuff with loads of butter. And so that was my comfort food. And you know what? It still is. It's not gone away, but it's yeah. just actually my, my body made me really oversensitive to dairy now. So if I eat butter, it makes me ill. <laughs> mm -hmm. Doesn't stop me sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I I was just gonna say I think that's an important part to say because that's also something else that people will say is like oh like I I really know that I can't eat sugar I can't eat you know gluten I know that I feel bad when I have carbs in the morning right like I they have all these things and it's like I totally get that I understand <laughs> when I, I know that those foods make me what but I'm a human being and at certain times I am choosing the comfort regardless of the way I'm gonna feel after so yeah. I just yeah, I think it's important to normalize to people. Like, I yeah. think where, where the diet mentality gets people stuck and has it where when as soon as the diet stops or you get triggered by your sister, you gain it all yeah. back again within a month's yeah. time or is, you know, the lack of permission to be a human and to, you know, have those foods at all at any point in time. And like that is actually key. You do need to get, grant yourself permission to have those things if you want them in yeah. order to have relationship with food but then also the peaceful relationship with self of like okay I forgive myself for you know eating that that's now making me feel tired and I want to take a nap you know the truth yeah. is I was having a hard time with a hard emotion and I didn't have the resources I need to needed to you know use whatever other tools there's no right or wrong way to soothe but I think for my clients it's about expanding their options for how they can soothe themselves yes. and then yes. having a broader you know ability to pick from those things and food can be one of them and that's yeah. totally okay. absolutely and and i think it's about empowering our clients to know that they have a choice yes you know, there is no right or wrong there is no should or shouldn't um there is no ought to or ought not to and there is no good or bad food you know and and i think when because they, they come out with this kind of language automatically i did absolutely um and then you know when i trained in counseling became aware of the effect of language mm. now what we say to ourselves is the most powerful thing and <clears throat> if we realize that we have a choice and if we become aware of what we're saying to ourselves, that's where the power is. I love that you're saying that. Absolutely. I'm trained in neuro-linguistic programming. I remember for myself, the, um, I was always out there for other people. I was always able to empower others. I was able to make everybody else kind of the people pleaser thing, make everybody else feel happy. Right. Yeah, and then yeah ending that I was happy myself like <laughs> like I was like everything's great I'm talking about this in past podcasts like yes like I was just like just really and then really getting that I the conversation like there was no problem with my relationships out there with people because I was being that for other people but my relationship with myself was awful mm -hmm. and so that was yeah. when I would internalize I wouldn't even know what was happening I remember mm -hmm. just maybe a year and a half ago I discovered how much anger I was feeling, you know, in my body at times. And I realized that a lot of that anger was self-hatred. And I didn't even know that, right? So having to slow down, like you're saying, 
what's happening. And then what, what am I saying to myself? And it's like, it was awful stuff. It was like, wow. Yeah. And it, yeah. you know, and that would be what would cause me to really eat a lot, you know, in, in a way that yeah. would scare me. I was really trying to numb this anger. I didn't even know it was anger. And I didn't even know it was self-hatred. I didn't even know what I was saying to myself, but then to be able to start repairing that, mm-hmm. you know, to be able to soothe myself and have compassion for myself so that, so that we can make the choices and empower yeah. our clients to be able to do that. Absolutely. And not deny the fact that that stuff is there because that's something I see a lot. And obviously what I was doing mm-hmm. is pretending that that stuff isn't there. And um, it's like in order for us to feel true, authentic happiness and joy, you yeah. also need to feel the true, authentic hatred, anger, sadness, mm-hmm. right? In order to get to that place. So I love that yeah. you're saying that. Mm-hmm. yeah awesome and what is the, oh go ahead you want to say something well, that's, it's really important mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. because as children <clears throat> we are taught not to express how we feel mm-hmm. that's where the initial damage is done so that you know although i get some clients come to me with major trauma in their past life mm-hmm. but there's it's what i call trauma with a small t they've dismissed Mm -hmm. but what they don't realize is that as a child it's still trauma Mm -hmm. so you know when my my father was in the navy and so when he went away to sea he was away for three or four months at a time for me that was a major trauma now Mm. yes he missed me i was little i was you know i hate to say it but i was his favorite and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you know I adored my dad and um so when he came back I would follow him around everywhere this little top trying to follow him I'd wake him up during the night just to make sure he was still there and just to push his photograph around in my little push chair buggy thing so you know for a child a young child that's trauma yes. but as an adult it's oh you know sorry couldn't avoid it and Mm -hmm. so i think that that we don't we're very hard on ourselves Mm. very hard on ourselves yeah Mm. everybody that i talk to that's the main issue is how hard we are on ourselves Mm. um 100 and i love what you're saying about the you know i i also refer to as the big t and little t trauma right and i talk about that when i first started my business i had written just like for fun, an article that was talking about first world problems, because I think the shame really kicks in. And I have conversations with people who will be like, yeah, but that person really had trauma happen. And it's like your trauma, if you didn't have trauma at that level, your trauma is still the most significant trauma and it has to be addressed. So, you know, even though dad and, you know, probably loved you very much and it was totally okay, whatever, if your little girl takes that as a uh, fear of abandonment, then that's going to show up everywhere in your life, yep. you know? So, yep. and that's, that's, and that will cause you to eat and that will cause your relationships not to work and it will, right. And it's just, that's just the way you were wired. That's what happens. So you can't avoid it. And, you know, for anybody who's listening, it's like, that's, that's the problem right there is just not acknowledging that your trauma is your trauma and yeah. your pain is your pain it doesn't there's no amount of it 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 might sound stupid or you're afraid to say it because you think somebody else is going to think that's so because that's what would happen to me is i would talk about the food stuff all the time and how much i was paranoid about this and the feedback i got was always just kind of like oh come on stop it's not true you know so then but but that was my trauma and you know and i quieted Mm -hmm. myself and then it became bigger and bigger and bigger so yeah, mm. there is no trauma too big mm. or too small. It's no, all part. Absolutely not. No. You're you know, and, and the thing is that I, I said to somebody this morning in a networking group, you know, that I think um this one of the big things we do for our clients is listen to them. Mm. Because so many of them feel unheard. Yeah. Particularly women. Yeah. Um <clears throat> and you know, the issues that we have, um, we put other others before ourselves and then we lose sight of who we are. Mm. And, you know, f- for me, 
feeling in my body, feeling love for the first time, when I was almost 60, it made me cry because I, you know, I fell in love. I met a new man and I fell in love. It was like, oh my God, is this how it feels? Good grief. You know, I, I kind of, I knew here in my head about love. I loved my children here, but I didn't know how it felt in my heart until that point in time. And it was like a bolt of lightning had hit me. Wow. When I'm, when I, when my granddaughter was on her way and my son would send me pictures, they had a lot of scans and stuff and they would send me pictures. And I had this <clears throat> feeling because I have this strong connection to spiritual connection to my father and my granny who are both passed. <clears throat> and I saw, I was sitting down and I saw this, this cord that connected me to them in the past and then through my son to my granddaughter in the present. And, and I'm, oh my God, I can feel this too. Being able to feel, really feel stuff, it, it's such a gift to me, such a gift. And although I'd done the work, Wendy had guided me to doing the work. Mm -hmm. And that's the value that we bring for our clients is that we are their guide and mentor on their journey. We don't do it for them, they do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Where the power is. Absolutely. Yeah. And I say it all the time like it's scary to go through those emotions. And if you don't know how to do that, you can't do that. No. Right. So you absolutely, I believe you absolutely need a guide for that stuff. I've always had a coach who has done the thing that I can't figure out how to do or is stressing me out because yeah, yeah I'm not going to pretend that I, you know, know how to do that. And yeah, it's definitely, yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, you know, you felt that bolt of lightning with the relationship, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the love and all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, just the ability to feel, you know, I remember I, had a uh, somebody I was dating whose brother had a poster that said, "Thank you for helping me feel," and wow. it was something that he and his wife. It was like a gift they were given to at their wedding, and I thought that was the most you know cool yes. thing. And I remember that kind of similar experience having to me, happening to me. So I'm curious your thoughts about this, but I have this thought about first of all, I think as far as relationship with self goes, I think the most fundamental place that anybody can work on the relationship with themselves probably is catalyzed by food just because it's the first thing that we are introduced to as babies that equals love it equals you know all of these kinds of things so when people come to me and they're ready to tackle this part of their lives and oftentimes there are people who are super successful and professional and they do amazing work in the world but they just haven't been able to tackle this part right and it's yeah. to me not a coincidence because probably all the things that we've said here like you just learned how to just totally be out there with people but never have addressed the inside and all that um and they'll have some shame about that and i'm like no i actually feel like maybe you hit the point of your success or now you actually have some time to reflect on you and work on the areas of your life for yourself that aren't working now that you've mastered this outward level of success and yeah. you know then always pretty much always there is in your if your relationship with yourself isn't working then your relationship out there with other human beings is probably not working as well as you'd like it right. to so you know by doing this work and feeling that it allows there to be attracted in someone else who can love you at the same you know amount that you are actually able to love yourself now that you've been doing this work Prior to that for myself, you know, continuing to tolerate relationships that the, the treatment was not as amazing as I deserved to have it or what I was giving out was not being brought back and I didn't even know, right? Mm -hmm. And all of these kinds of things. But I remember also meeting someone who that unconditional love of like, oh my gosh, like every single part of anything I'm saying is totally loved unconditionally. Like there is... I could be anything. I could be angry. I could be sad. I can be happy. I could be present. I could be sleeping. Like that person is just only love. And it was yeah. just like, oh my gosh. And it's reflecting back to me all the work that I've done on myself to be able to see like, I am that as well. 
Yes. I've always been that, but I just never had a mirror for that. And, and just the overwhelming feeling that that had of like, oh my gosh, that's pretty amazing. Is yeah. Yeah. So like, Absolutely. Again, we, it's like more than the food. It's like, it starts with the food, but is your relationship working? Probably not. Is your wor- job working? Probably not. Do you have a toxic boss? Oh. Probably, yeah. you know, like, so again, we start, you know, not being able to tolerate the things that aren't working and then having to just walk a line of faith that like if somebody else is saying that there is such thing as unconditional love out there and you've never experienced that for yourself it's like then that's when you hire that coach and you're like okay like we have to walk this line of faith because we don't know where that person is relationship is the only thing you can't really control because you can't you know you can't really control when that person or whatever so a lot of patience and a lot of inner work that has to go into that Mm -hmm. and it's not and it it is an inside job with we are as a society we are focused outside we we buy stuff we go on holiday we buy a new car you know we want stuff but actually that is just because we want to feel better about ourselves but we can feel better about ourselves without any of that Yes. So good. And that's when it takes away all the charge around the weight gain because it's like, it doesn't matter because I know inherently that I am, you know, worthy and deserving and, and it's like, okay. And the way my body looks or the way I'm eating, like, it doesn't mean anything about me. Right. It's loses that charge. And then because we lose that charge, then naturally we don't care about food as much. (laughs) Then usually the weight can, you know, start to come Come off or on its own. It's the opposite of what anybody would think. Yeah. Really yeah. beautiful. Awesome. Well, this is a great conversation. I could talk to you all day about that, Carol. So thank you for being here. And um, yeah, how can people find out about you and your programs? Um, well, at the moment, I'm, I'm on social media. Um, I have my own um, private face group, um, which is called Stop Dieting and Start Living Your Life. Um, wow anybody is welcome to join me there my new website will be up um and that's called will be called the disruptive health and um i'm also on instagram which is where i post all my food pictures <laughs> nice. um and i should have another facebook group called carol's kitchen where but that's not i mean that is just where people enjoy food people are sharing um the things that they've made <clears throat> just for the joy of food which I hope I know. Yeah. Um, and and I'm on LinkedIn as well um, so I'm everywhere really <laughs> <laughs> you are everywhere I love that yeah. that's yeah. awesome and I'm sure you'll definitely have people reaching out to you from there I love your story it's amazing yeah. I also love the fact that you're so that you had the tall thing because I feel like I talk to a lot of people that are either really short or really tall. And I think sometimes maybe they're like, I don't fit in. And then maybe the food thing and the weight thing becomes a thing. Anyway, I had to yeah. put care of tons of research studies as to how we all end up in this situation and comparing ourselves to society and what yeah. we think we should do. All that stuff. And I and think anyway. also, you know, cause when you're tall, you take up more, more space in the world and as women in particular, um, and I'm a bit of a, you know, banner waver for women, um, women's rights and stuff. As women, we're taught to to not take up space in the world, mm-hmm. as small and as quiet as we can. And <clears throat> that applies to women, young women now, as well as us oldies. You know, it, it's come, it's still coming through the generations. And it might be you know, my daughter is my daughter's 35. And she experiences this in corporates in London, you know, is this anti-female thing. And, you know, she's over six foot tall. She's quite formidable when she walks into a room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So your daughter's scary. No, she's not. You're just scared of her. And you know what? You should be <laughs> because she's a strong young woman with a focus. She knows what she wants. Um, and in business, she's great. In her personal life, she's not so great. <laughs> you know, I get it. You know for all path. of us, it's a journey, isn't it? Exactly. She's on her path. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And I saw 
off my podcast listeners know uh, women's empowerment is, you know, that was like my first business card when I first started. It was like women's empowerment oh. and entrepreneurship. So, oh. uh, really good for, you know, actually having a sustainable business, but it's what I really care about, you know, yeah. and I think as I've had to learn how to empower myself and have my own voice, because I was definitely more, you know, I would internalize and be quiet and just kind of watch and all these kinds yeah. of things, which led me to be a great listener and a great leader and all the other things. But then at certain points, whatever you're, you know, the opposite of your strong suit is, it's like, it's going to get in your way of being able to move to your next level. So absolutely. You know, and it's, it's yeah. a journey. It's, yeah. it's, it's a never ending journey. And, you know, that was, you know, I, I do my program and it's for a certain amount of time, but then I always say to people, the fun really starts when, when you're past caring about the food and body and weight, and you're actually now expanding out to what other awarenesses do I have about myself that I can actually apply that's going to cause me to attract my soulmate and yeah. right? have the job of my dreams or start my own business or whatever that yeah. is for people. And, yeah. and that's why I love the name of your Facebook group, you know, start living your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah because I, I didn't. My life was on hold for decades. And, wow. I, you know, I'm not unique. There's thousands of other women like me. Oh my gosh, exactly. Right. And it's like, when are you going to take action on it? I'm, in this podcast, mm -hmm. I am all about like, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Coach me, Leslie, at gmail.com. Email me right now. And I'm saying yes. it right now because it's like, I don't want people waking up, you know, regard, like at 60, at 70, at 80, mm -hmm. and then saying, you know, it's like, it's, you can't avoid this work. <laughs> no. You have to do this if you really authentically want to be happy and really appreciate every single aspect of your life. There's not one thing during my day that I'm not totally happy and enamored yeah. with. And if there is, you know, then I find a way to make it happy and, and you know, yeah. great. Yeah indeed so really i'm happy. on that all the way <laughs> I'll just give a virtual high yeah. five and <laughs> yeah, thank you so much um tell us one more time the best way to contact you just maybe one of those platforms that you think is the easiest yeah i'm on facebook so you can message me um and my group uh, my private group is called stop dieting and start living your life beautiful carol may <laughs> disruptive health coach thank you so much for being here and again if you guys want to email me for anything coach me leslie at gmail.com that'll start taking action on your life thank you so much carol I'll talk to you soon yeah Bye. thank you very much leslie